Okay, yeah. We talked about convergence criteria for series. Uh, yeah, there was this Cauchy criterion which is related to the definition of Cauchy sequence. I repeated this definition last time so, uh, and that will be quite important in the future. Um, yeah. So then, then yeah. Um, so actually I found while preparing today a couple of errors in the script, uh, mostly uh, typing errors or translation errors. Uh, the reason is that I had the script translated by someone else and so there are sometimes misunderstandings and translation errors but I will uh, correct them um, and uh, so please correct them in the script and you will get an up so we keep the script updated online huh? so if at some later stage you download the script again from my web page then you will have an updated version with all, hopefully, with all errors that we know corrected. Okay? So, for example, one, one error is that this is, a, I mean, it, that was a literal translation from the German term. It's uh, the comparison, uh, comparison test. Okay, and this also is not a quotient criterion, it's the ratio test. Yeah, okay, and I already, I guess I already corrected, this has to be series. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we looked at this uh, ratio test uh, last time. So, whenever uh, for our uh, series, um, the absolute value of the ratio of two successive elements in the series is less than or equal to some number Q which has to be smaller than 1, then the series converges. Yeah? And the reason is, I mean, or how can this be proved? I don't do it here. You can prove this ratio uh, test uh, by using um, this comparison test and you can compare your series with the geometric series. And in the geometric series, there we exactly have that the ratio of two successive elements is equal to Q. To Q. Yeah? Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay, so ah, here we see it. The, so the proof idea, you show that, and what you have here, this is uh, a geometric series. We prove that this uh, geometric series uh, is, uh, is bigger than uh, the actual series. Yeah? Okay, um, yeah, let's look at this example. So we take this series here and uh, we prove that it converges by using the ratio test. Uh -huh. So we compute the ratio of two successive elements and that's what we have here. And now if we uh, look at these two terms, then this becomes what we have here. 1 plus 1 over n squared. Uh, um, and now, I mean, if we, if we use n equal 3 here, then this is what we get. Uh? So for n equal 3, this is equal to this. And for any n greater than 3, uh, this becomes smaller, of course. And therefore, we can say this is less than or equal to this. Uh? And now we compute the result here, so this is 4 third squared is uh, 16 divided by 9 times 1 half is 8, 8 divided by 9, which is less than 1, and we are finished. Okay, 
Yeah, so, um, yeah, let's look at this example again. This is what we call a series. Huh? And the series always has, I mean, if you write it explicitly, then uh, it has the form a0 plus a1 plus a2 plus and so on until infinity. Um, and these numbers here, they are constants. Huh? They may be 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus and so on. And then the result of this infinite sum is either finite or not. Huh? But if it's finite, then it's just a number. Okay, and now we make it a little bit more interesting. Um, now let's look at what we have here. I mean, this is quite similar to the example before, with the little difference that there, there occurs an x inside the sum. Huh? Uh, so then, um, I mean, yeah, let's write this explicitly. I mean, this is the definition of the exponential function. x of x is equal to n equals 0. So we get a 1 plus n equals 2. We have x squared divided by 2 plus x third power divided by factorial plus and so on. And now what you see is here this is no longer a constant this sum. It depends on x. But as soon as you put a fixed x in here, for example x equal 1, then we are back here. And that's what we call a power series. Yeah? And one example uh, for a power series is the series for the exponential function. Yeah? And now we can prove that the power series for the exponential function converges for an arbitrary x. That's very important. Now we can put an arbitrary x here, or I, I mean, no, let's say uh, the other way. Uh, we can ask ourselves for which real numbers x does this series converge? Does it converge for all x or only for x between 0 and 1 or whatever? Um, yeah. Um, and I mean, you can see it here. For each x in the real numbers, the power series is convergent. Huh? Okay, we use uh, the, uh, the ratio test. And the ratio gives us um, x to the power n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial ta uh, yeah, times n factorial divided by x power n. And now a lot of uh, stuff cancels out. I mean, these two guys give an x here in the enumerator, and the n factorial cancels out with the n plus 1 factorial, and that's what remains. Huh? So now we have the absolute value of x divided by n plus 1. I mean, we don't need the absolute value here because n is positive. Huh? Um, okay, and now, now it's, it gets interesting because here we have our variable x and here we have this counter n. Yeah? And now you can vary x or n, you, make, you can make n uh, big, but x may become big too, x may be even bigger than n. And now the question is, what do we fix? and what, uh, uh, what is not fixed. And uh, I mean, that's why I uh, mentioned before, if here you fix your n, then we are back in this situation. 
uh, sorry, if you fix the x for a fixed x, we are back in this situation. And that's what we do over there too. I mean, we always, we want to know for an arbitrary x. So let's assume we have given any x, an arbitrary x, but we fix this x. Huh? So x is fixed now here, and, uh, or here, and now we let our n um, move towards infinity. And now for any fixed x, we can make this ratio smaller than 1. Ha and the question is, how big must my n be such that this ratio is less than or equal to 1 half? The answer is quite simple. We solve this inequality for n. And what we get is this, n greater than or equal to 2x <coughs> absolute minus 1. That's the result. And it, it does not, de uh, I mean, yes, it, this n does depend on x. But for each x, no matter what value x has, we can find such an n such that this holds. And then we are, we are finished. Because the ratio is less than or equal to uh, a number smaller than 1, and we are finished. I mean, that uh, selecting 1 half here was an arbitrary choice. You could also write 0.9 here, and then uh, this formula would be a little bit different. Okay, yeah, a special case uh, of the exponential function is x equal 1. And that's what we have here. If we put 1 in here, then we get this as a result. So then you see this is the sum over all inverse factorials and uh, we already know from here that this series converges so this is the definite number and the name for this number is E, the Euler's number. And because we have proven that the series converges for arbitrary x we can now define a function based on this power series. But this is very important. If you cannot prove that your power series converges, then it may not be a function because it may be undefined for maybe all x or some x. So be, be, uh, before you talk about a function, you have to prove that your power series converges. <coughs> I mean, this is a really a serious issue. Whenever you have to do with power series, the first thing is you have to check whether it converges or in which area it converges. Okay. Yes, and um, yeah. One thing which is really inconvenient in practice is this infinity here. I mean, we have now defined this exponential function. This is the definition of the exponential function. And now you might ask, I mean, on your pocket calculator there is this button exp. And if you press this button exp, then it will compute the series. No, of course it will not. Because no pocket calculator has infinite time resources to calculate such an infinite series. What does the, your pocket calculator do? Nobody has an idea. Yes, so the pocket calculator approximates the function. That's true. But how, how does this work, approximating the function? It checks where 
<laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's what mathematicians have done before. Because if the exponential function would not converge, you would not have this button on your pocket calculator. The pocket calculator does no conversions check. It, does, it just does computation. Huh? But how? Because the, the series is infinite. I mean, it's as simple as it can be. If we, if we have no infinite resources, yeah, then we stop after a finite time. So we just replace this infinite by 20 or by 10 or maybe by 3 even. So if we are really lazy, we just replace the infinite by 3. And we calculate the first three elements of our series, sum them up, and that's it. Huh? And that's what we call an approximation. It's of course not the exact result, but it is an approximation. And now I hope, I mean, what is your question now? If we stop after the third element, does that make you happy? No. Why not? Be because it's not exact enough. Yeah? yeah, maybe it's not exact enough. Maybe it is exact enough. So what we, need, what we want to know is how big is the error that we make in just cutting the sequence after a finite term. Huh? And that's what we have on this slide. This is the theorem about the remainder of our uh, power series, uh, of, uh, of the power series for the exponential function. Look, we now calculate it up to the term number capital N. And then, of course, we make an error, and this is what we call the remainder term, Rn of x. And, of course, it would be nice if your pocket calculator would know something about this remainder term. Huh? But it won't tell you. If you press X or 5, you will just see a result, but not uh, in the second line. And the remainder term is 10 to the power minus uh, 25. Huh? You won't see this. But here we have this. And we even have an estimation. We have a formula for this remainder term. This remainder is less than or equal to 2 times um, x power n plus 1 divided by n plus, plus 1 factorial. Um, for x less than or equal to this term, or n greater than, I mean, this is the more interesting, uh, uh, the more interesting formula, because this tells me how big my n must be for a certain x. Yeah? Yeah. <coughs> now, what does your pocket calculator do? I mean, your pocket calculator has a, a representation in the display of, I don't know, maybe 10 digits. So, if the representation is 10 digits, then your pocket calculator knows the result must be more accurate than 10 to the power minus 10. Huh? And then, so we know that our Rn must be less than 10 to the power minus 10. Oh, let me see. Uh, don't we have an example? Oh, yes, we do have an example here. Look at this example. Um, if we take n equals 15, capital N equals 15 means we take 15 terms in our series. Okay. And then the remainder term is less than or equal to 
uh, about 10 to the power minus 13. And this means taking 15 terms in the series would be okay um, for a pocket calculator that represents 12 digits. Yeah? And then the, the error would be in the 13th digit, which you don't see anymore. Yeah. I mean, what we did here is we fixed n and then computed r uh, n equals 15, and we then computed r 15. But we can also do it the other way around. We can solve our equation for n given this. So if we know our um, display has 12 digits, then we say, okay, error must be smaller than 10 to the power minus 13, and then we solve this equation for n, and we would get n equals 15. Oh yeah, okay, and this is the next uh, typo, uh, because the rounding error is not 15 times 10 to the power minus 13. Um, the rounding error, um, I mean, we are talking about this number here, and this is uh, digit number 12. The last digit here is 10 to the power minus 12. Um, yeah. And, oh, let me see, why do we have this plus minus? Uh, So I, I have to. I would have to check this. So this looks like for this for uh, calculating this e here, we didn't use n equal 15. Maybe we used n equal 14 because you see this error here is bigger than what we got there. Um, but this in 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 parentheses here, this is about the rounding error, which is something different. I mean. What we got here, this is the, re the reminder, just by cutting our sequence. And now then, your pocket calculator also has a rounding error, just because of the finite representation of your maybe 12 digits. And the rounding error typically is uh, less than or equal to five times the next digit. Huh? Or, in other words, if we have a 9 here, then the rounding error, the maximum rounding error is a 5 in the next digit. Yeah? So this shouldn't be 15, it should be 5. So just uh, delete this one here. Okay, yeah. Now let's look at this nice theorem, which is the functional equation of the exponential function. x of x plus y is equal to x of x times x of y. Maybe I should say a few words about uh, functional equation. Have you ever heard this term, functional equation? Who has heard it? Who has heard the term differential equation before? Oh, that's nice to see. Some of you have uh, heard it. Okay. And a functional equation is some, something simpler. I mean, yeah. What is a differential equation? Let me give you an example. Let's say f 
double prime of x plus uh, 3 times uh, 1 over f prime of x is equal to g of x. This is a functional, uh, sorry, this is a differential equation. It's a, a differential equation of second order. Huh? Because the highest derivative is of second order. Now let's make a functional equation out of it. We just remove all the derivatives. And now it's a functional equation. Okay, so this is a functional equation. But what is the difference to a normal equation? I mean, this is, if you just look at it as it is here, it is an ordinary equation and a functional equation. It depends on how I look at it. If I look from here, it's an ordinary equation. But if I look from here, yeah, it's a functional equation. So you, uh, yeah, maybe you should come here and just look. I mean, if you look at it as an ordinary equation, then you ask the question, given this function f and this function g, now continue, what is the rest of the, of the question? For an ordinary equation, I mean, of course, we always want to solve equations. Is that okay? We want to solve equations. What does it mean to solve an equation? To get the values which satisfy the equation. Yeah, which values? F of x and g of x. The values x. Yeah? So we are looking for the set of solutions x for this equation. Yeah? There might be no solution, one solution, two solutions, um, um, 17, infinitely many. We don't know it at the moment. Yeah? That's what we want to know for an ordinary equation. Huh? And also, I mean, if I would ask you to solve this equation, then I hope you would pretty soon ask me, but I can't solve this equation because I don't know f and g. Please give me the function f and the function g, and then I, if I give you these functions, let's say f is the exponential, then it would be x of x, plus uh, 3 over x of x is equal to, and let g be the sign of x. And now you have an explicit equation, and you can try to find the set of solutions. Okay. I mean, this is nothing new for you. But now we take this different view. Huh? Now we take this different view. Now we look at this equation, but I do not give you these functions f and g. Rather, I want to know... Oh, yes, let me give you g. I give you the function g. Let's put the sign here. Okay? And now I ask you, which is the set of functions not the set of numbers x. I ask you, what is the set of functions f that satisfy this equation for any real number x? And that's something different. Okay? Uh, now let's, let's make a uh, simple example. I write for you um, a functional equation. f of x plus y is equal to f of x plus f of y. This is a functional equation. And the question is, what is the set of functions, real valued functions, that satisfy this equation for arbitrary x and y? For all x and y.
And that's a very interesting <coughs> question. I mean, is there, is there only one function? Are there infinitely many functions? Is there no function that satisfies this equation? Maybe all functions satisfy this equation. I mean, let me tell you, from my experience in correcting mathematical exams, I almost uh, should conclude that this equation holds, holds for all functions. Because many students, they, they just use this formula for arbitrary functions. But it's not true. Huh? It's only true for a, uh, for a subclass of functions. But now, I mean, give me, give me one solution. Give me a function that satisfies this equation. Exponential? Are you sure? Huh? It's written here? Is it? I mean, we have it on the slide over there. That's what you mean, this formula? Ah, it's different, isn't it? Sinus? No, no chance. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah. All linear functions. Look, if f of x is equal to a times x, it's easy to prove that this equation holds. So now we, I mean, it's, it's really easy to prove this equation. I don't do it. You, you, uh, you can do it if you want. So what we now have proven is that all linear functions satisfy this equation. But we, what we have not proven is that all functions which are not linear do not satisfy this equation. I mean, some special cases are easy. To prove, for example, that f of x equals a times x plus b. For any b not equal to zero, um, this function does not satisfy this equation. That's easy to prove too. Huh? So as soon as we add something to our linear uh, function, um, it no longer satisfies this equation. Yeah. So that's the actually the the functional equation for linear functions. I mean, we need, uh, uh, in order to define the set of linear functions uh, in the real numbers perfectly, we need one more equation. We need uh, also f of alpha times x is equal to alpha times f of x. That's what we need too. Huh? Okay, so now uh, we talked about linear functions. And uh, so let's, let's make a parenthesis around these because that does not satisfy this equation. And now we have over there the uh, functional equation for the exponential function. And you see, this is a very nice property of the exponential function. You can, if you have the product of two exponentials, you can uh, transform it into one exponential with a sum. Now let me ask you another, uh, give you another example for a functional equation. f of x plus y is equal to f, uh, no, sorry, x times y is equal to f of x plus f of y. That's just kind of the opposite what uh, we have over there. Log. Yeah, thank you, it's a log. 
And that's not surprising because the log is uh, the inverse function of the exponential. Yeah. Okay, so maybe you, got, you now got an idea about what functional equations are. And we will come back to functional equations yeah, at some point later in the lecture. And um, I mean, functional equations are interesting whenever you, you are looking for a function for a certain purpose. Huh? And you maybe you know the properties of the function, but you don't know which function does satisfy these properties. For example, a very nice example, uh, Claude Shannon uh, proved it in the 1940s, is the entropy function. Shannon was looking for a function, I mean Shannon was working on communication channels and information loss over uh, communication channels, and so he was talking about information and loss of information, and he was looking for a function that, m that measures the information content of a message. Huh? And this message just consisted of a number of bits. So we ha he had, for example, a vector of 100 bits, and his question was, how big is the information contents of such a bit vector? Huh? So he was looking for a function, for a function, uh, let's call it uh, capital I of such a vector, um, let's call it B vector, a bit vector, um, with some properties. I don't remember which properties he required, but there was a couple of like four or five equations uh, that, that he required for such an information measure. Huh? So he was thinking which properties must this function have and he wrote down these four or five properties and then he started proving. And then he proved that um, it is the sum over i equal 1 to n um, b i times ln b i. Huh? That's what he proved. That this is up to a constant factor the only function that, re, uh, that satisfies all his requirements. I mean actually this is not the entropy what we have here. The entropy would be if you put a minus before. Huh? But we were not talking about the entropy, we were talking about information contents here and therefore we just uh, uh, omit the minus. Huh? Just as an example. Huh? Okay, um, yes. Yeah, the proof of this functional equation is not so easy. Huh? I mean, what, uh, it's, it's not surprising that we use the, the power series definition of the exponential function. So we just replace this by the power series definition and this and that, but then I mean, what's not really easy is, this is an infinite series times an infinite series. Huh? And how do we uh, calculate the product of two infinite series? And there is uh, a nice theorem about such series products, which is not easy to prove and which we don't use here. And, but if we use then this theorem, we could prove uh, the functional equation. Yeah. And what's even more difficult is, suppose I give you this functional equation and I ask you, give me a power series that satisfies this functional equation, that's even harder. And this uh, little sub-area of mathematics called functional equations is a quite funny sub-area. Um, it's, it's a little area, but it's quite important. Okay, conclusions from our functional equation are that the exponential function of minus x is 1 over the exponential of x 
that x of x is positive all the time and for all um, integers um, x of n is e to the power n. Okay, yeah, I don't go into this proof. You can read it and if you have a question, ask it next Monday. Now let's talk about continuity. Continuous functions are very important because they are smooth functions. Yeah? Um, and before we can talk about uh, continuity, um, we need some little definition about the limit of a function. I mean the limit of the limit up to now was defined for what? For which mathematical objects is the limit defined? Yeah, for sequences and series, yes. Uh, basically for sequences, but series are sequences. Huh? Yes, so the limit is defined for a sequence. Huh? So whenever we have a li had a limit up to now, we have something like the limit n towards infinity of, let's say, 1 over n, and this limit is 0. Huh? That's the basic thing. But what's important here, this, this uh, variable n here is an index. It is an integer index. It goes like 1, 2, 3, 4. Huh? And now what we define now here, let's look at this. If we have such a function mapping from the, some uh, defini definition area to the real numbers, um, then we write the limit of x towards a f of x is equal to c. No? And now this is different because here we don't have integers n towards infinity. No, we let our x approach a. And then f of x must be equal to c, something like that. Um, now let's look at uh, this picture. I mean, if we look at this picture, it's immediately obvious. We let our x approach this value a, and then f of x approaches some value c. Huh? <coughs> now, how can we understand this? I mean, maybe intuitively you, you understand it, it's easy. But how can we formally uh, define this term? And formally we define it in the following way. This x towards a is nothing but a sequence where we have the limit for n towards infinity of xn is equal to a. We have one sequence of x's on the x-axis. And then we have another sequence, limit, of, uh, for n towards infinity, f of xn is equal to c. And so if for all, and that's important, for all sequences xn, that converge to this value a, the corresponding sequence of the function values f of x n converges to this value c, then, then we can write limit x towards a f of x is equal to c. So we, yeah, we could actually write if for all sequences xn that converge towards a, 
if for all such sequences this holds, it holds that this is true, then we can write this. This is just a, th a shorthand for what we have here. You don't have to write it down because it's here in this definition. Okay? No questions? Fine. Um, yeah, we now define the floor function. This is what we call the floor function of x. It denotes the unique integer number um, that is less than or equal to x. Um, Yeah, so the next smaller integer, actually. Okay. And now let's talk about limits. Example. The limit for x towards 0 of x of x is equal to 1. Huh? But the limit for x towards 1 of this four floor function does not exist. Let's look at the graph of this function. Here we have the graph. <coughs> and these dots mean, I mean here we have a jump. And the dot means f of 1 is equal to 1 and not 0. And f of 2 is 2 and so on. This is the floor function. But the limit, what was, which limit did we use for x towards 1? The limit for x towards 1 does not exist. Why? Now look at the definition. Um, yeah, actually at this definition. Why is this limit, um, also in this example it would be uh, the limit x towards 1 of the floor function of x. This limit is undefined. Why? Yes, but I, I want to have an explanation based on this definition. You're right, yeah, but this is too intuitive. When you substitute the value of x equal to 1 in the equation, then you will not get the uh, right hand side. Uh, again, so if we substitute x equal 1 here, yeah, then we don't talk about exponential, we talk about the floor function. Exponential is, is perfect, huh? but here we have the problem with this floor function. Because when it's x goes to 1, we can get two equations which a can be 1 and 0. No. No. I mean, here is the definition of our floor function. It is unique. And oh, maybe it's even easier to see here. For all x less than 1, the value is 0. For x equal 1 and greater, the value is 1. 
So this is a function and it's, it's well defined and unique, everything is fine. The only problem is that this is not defined, this expression. And I tell you why, because of this little verb all here. Why is this all here so important? Look, um, let's take, oops, yeah, now let's take a sequence of x's and suppose it converges to 1, huh? limit x towards 1. So we have to consider all sequences of x's whose limit is equal to a, and a is 1 here. Okay, so now we, we took this one sequence that converges to 1 from the left. And now we take a second sequence that converges to 1 from the right. Okay? If for all sequences of x's, the limit of the f of x's is equal to c, is the same. But now what is the limit of the f of x's for the blue sequence? What is the limit of the function values? Just near 1? No, it's far from 1. No, it is far from 1. Where is it? What is the limit of the function values? Hey, that surprises me. I mean, the function values is what you can read from this axis. It is 0. Okay, so the limit of the... Of the the f of x is of the blue guys is zero. Now let's look at this sequence. What is the limit of the f of x is of the blue guys? It is one because because the f of x is they are here. Huh? Or yeah, maybe no. It 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 would actually be. But uh, it's it's hard to draw. I mean, the f of x is they're they're all here. Huh? It's a constant. It's a constant uh, sequence, and this constant sequence has, of course, the limit one. Okay, and so now we found two different sequences of x's with. Uh, where the f of x is of the first sequence have the limit uh, 0 and the f of x is of the second series has the limit 1 and so there is not one constant c we have two constants and therefore this is not applicable so this term is not well defined I mean this is really this is important um, and and uh, I mean also in the in the examination this is a master course now and it is different from a bachelor's course in a bachelor's course maybe it is sufficient that you have some intuitive feeling and somebody tells you okay a function is continuous if you can write it in one line without uh, going off the paper and maybe that's okay for, for the bachelor's but in the masters you really should try to understand the formal reasoning and you have to go back to the definition all the time so that's what you, you should be able all the time if somebody asks you something to track it all down to the definition and so go back to this definition 
and not just look at the picture and say, oh yes, I see it immediately. Yeah? Um, because there are so many uh, examples and cases where you have no chance at all to see anything with any pictures. I mean, we can just draw pictures in one-dimensional cases, but what are if your, your uh, space of axis is 27-dimensional, uh, which is not unusual, you can't see anything. So then you really have to argument formally uh, there is no other chance. That's what you have to, to practice in the exercises. Okay, um, yeah, let's continue. Um, yeah, and we have a third example. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we're here talking about polynomials. Here we have such a polynomial of degree k. Um, and uh, we show that for x towards infinity um, there is no limit. So uh, the, the function um, yeah, goes towards infinity. Yeah. For x towards infinity this holds for all polynomials of this form, and what's important here is that the first coefficient of the highest term is 1, is positive. Uh, if this coefficient is negative, then of course the result is inverted, then we get minus infinity. Okay, and for x towards minus infinity, we get infinity if k is even, so if this k is even, or minus infinity if k is odd. And how can we prove this? This is quite easy. Um, we just draw this x to the power k out of the whole polynomial and we write it like x power k times 1 plus and now look at this term here the power is um, k minus 1 if we divide this by k we get a 1 over x and here we get a 2 over x squared and so on uh -huh. And now if you look at this representation, then if we call this rest here g of x, then we immediately see that for x towards infinity, what happens with this g of x? For x towards infinity. Yeah, it converges to zero, of course. So that means for x towards infinity, we just can neglect all these terms. We can neglect all these terms, and what remains is x to the power k. I mean, this is a proof you never should forget, because this is so basic. For x towards infinity, the dominant term of a polynomial is always the highest term. Huh? The term with the highest power is dominant for x towards infinity and you can neglect all the rest. And this is the easy proof for that. And now this is the dominant term and uh, we, we easily see that for x towards infinity this goes to infinity. Okay. Uh, this, of course, has to be follows. Um, yeah, okay, that's what we already said. So the limit of x power k is infinity, and uh, yeah, and, and thus we, we have proven the theorem. Okay, yeah. Uh, and now we finally can define what continuity means. And we will use this uh, definition um, for the limit of a function. So let f be a function um, and a some point in the definition area, then f is called continuous at the point a if the limit for x towards a 
of f of x is equal to f of a. That's the definition of continuity. f is called continuous in the whole definition area if it is continuous in every point of d. Okay, and now let's look at this picture. Here we have a function which is not continuous because this does not hold. I mean, I could say, oh yes, it does hold. Let's take this sequence of x's. Oh no, sorry, we don't need, we don't use this sequence. We take a sequence here of x's, the x's converge to a, and the f of x's, they converge to f of a. Everything's fine. But only for this one sequence, not for all sequences. If I take this sequence of x's, then the x's converge to a, but the f of x's, they converge to this value, to this value, and this value is not f of a. f of a is this value, and obviously our f of x's do not converge to this point. That's because of this all here. Okay, examples. The constant function is continuous on the whole real numbers. That's trivial. Exponential function is continuous on whole R. The identity function, uh, which is just the diagonal, uh, is continuous. And now we, we can conclude that uh, we, ca we can immediately extend our continuity to an infinite uh, number of functions uh, by some uh, combination theorem, this theorem here. Uh. So let f and g be functions that are at some point a continuous um, and let yeah and we take some real number r then the uh, the sum of the two functions the pro the product of function times constant the product of two functions they are all continuous and if g of a is not zero, then even the ratio of the two functions also is continuous. Okay, and that's very nice because whenever I have two continuous functions, I can produce new continuous functions. Okay, and uh, how can this theorem be proven? Of course, you have to prove these, these equations here. So, uh, that, that uh, the limit for n towards infinity of f plus g of xn is f plus g of a. For any sequence xn which has the limit a. That has to be proven. And that can easily be proven, all these equations can easily be proven by using the properties for the sum and the product and so on of sequences. <coughs> yeah, that's actually a nice exercise. I don't know whether we have it in the exercises, but go home and prove, for example, this property or any, or any of these. It's easy, maybe it is so easy that is hard for you to do the proof. Huh? Because you just have to elementarily use the definitions for the sum of two sequences. Not the definitions, this, this property that um, the sum of two sequences, uh, no, for two sequences the limit of the sum of the two sequences is the sum of the limits of the two sequences. That's what you have to use and you can immediately prove this. <coughs> OK, 
Okay, and now we have an, another uh, definition, which is this here, the composition of two functions. Um, and that's what we often write in this way. And, and we, we call this G after F. That means we first apply f to our x, and then we apply g. Huh? And uh, so, normally we write it in this way, g of f of x. But sometimes we also use this notion, and this is always used when we do not apply this combination of g and f to x. Huh? Because then, I mean, it would be kind of uh, weird to write g of f of nothing, or how, how would you write this? This is not the name of a function, yeah? Okay, yeah, so f after g applied to x can be written in this way, or the square root and the sine and so on. Um, yeah. And now this is a nice theorem again, and this again gives us infinitely many continuous functions. Immediately, whenever I have two continuous functions, f and g, then the composition of these two is continuous too. But here we have to be careful. Um, f, if f is continuous at some point a, then g has to be continuous at the point f of a. Because, of course, g is being applied on the result of the calculation of f. Okay, if this holds, then the composition is continuous too. I also omit this proof. I mean, this is, we are still in the repetition of basic analysis. Yeah? And you, you have seen all these proofs before. Uh, yeah. Okay, now let's look at an example. Let's look at this function. x divided by x squared plus a. And you uh, now... Suppose you have to prove that this function is continuous. There are many ways to prove this. For example, you can really go back to the definition and try to show that for this function our definition with, with the limit of f of a and so on, uh, that this holds. But this is not so nice and easy. It's much easier and very often you can prove continuity in this really simple way. We just apply this theorem and um, this theorem for the composition and the sum and products of functions and we can very easily prove that uh, the function is continuous. I mean here the numerator x is continuous. That's what we know already. Okay, now let's look at the denominator. The denominator x squared is continuous. We prove that all polynomials are continuous. Then the sum, and, and a constant function is continuous too. And here we have the sum of two continuous functions, which is continuous too. So the denominator is continuous. And now we have the ratio of uh, a continuous function divided by another continuous function. And this is continuous too, but only if hmm? no, not x a no. Yes, x squared plus a is not allowed to be zero. The denominator may never be zero. Yeah. Okay. 
And now let's do it really formally. This is actually the, um, I mean, I could have omitted uh, all before about continuity. This is the real definition of continuity. Yeah? Uh, this really tells you what it means for a function to be continuous. Huh? That's called the so-called so epsilon delta definition of continuity. Huh? So a function f is continuous at some point x0 if and only if for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that for all x, um, if x minus x zero absolutely is less than delta, then f of x minus f of x zero absolutely has to be smaller than epsilon. That's the definition of continuity. Now let's look at the picture here in this picture. For all epsilon greater than zero, and whenever you read a for all epsilon greater than zero, then you, you, you should have in mind, oh, that guy means extremely small epsilons. He doesn't mean for all epsilon. He actually means for all very, very tiny epsilon, okay? So suppose we take such a really small epsilon, and this epsilon has to be around f of x0. Uh, why? Look at this. f of x minus f of x0 absolutely is smaller than epsilon. And this is nothing but such a two epsilon ribbon around our x0. Uh, whenever my x is somewhere in between here in this interval, then this inequality holds. And that's what we finally want to have. Okay? Now, if I want to prove that my function is continuous, then I can select an arbitrarily, typically extremely small epsilon. Now, suppose this is such an extremely small epsilon. Now, in order to prove that our function is continuous, I have to find a delta. For all epsilon, there exists a delta. And also, typically, this delta also is very small. But this delta, that it depends on my epsilon. This delta gives me, oh, that's not so nice, let me see. Yeah, this picture is not so nice. I have to correct this picture. So let's look where we have green. Yeah, this is green. So the green line should actually be here. And now, yeah, and here you have these two deltas around x0 and uh, this is our epsilon, and here we have this epsilon 2. Okay, so you can select such a small epsilon. If you can find a delta on the x-axis such that for all x which are in this ribbon here, if f of x, this is the red point on, on our function, is in this two epsilon area, everything is fine. Then the function is continuous. Okay. You, you really understand it if we look at this picture, at a discontinuous function, because here you cannot find such a delta for all epsilon. Look, if, so this is the value 1, 
And then my function makes a jump up to 2 here. Huh? And if we take epsilon equal to 1 half, and we take this, um, let's see, yeah. Hmm. And we take this uh, as x0, we take this point where we have the jump. And if we take epsilon equal 1 half, then we get, we exactly get this interval. So let's draw, yeah. So now our interval is exactly what we have here. Now we have to find a delta such that for all, so yeah, suppose we have such a delta here. And then we take an x here, this as an x, and then our f of x is here, and that's outside this interval, yeah, this green interval. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it would actually, yeah, Let's use epsilon equal. Maybe you correct it in the script too. With, uh, then it's really obvious. Epsilon equal one over four, and then um, our green line would be here. And then there is no chance. Then there is no chance to find such a delta. I mean, you can use this here, and the function value is this. Even if it's extremely small, your delta then you get here, but you never end up inside, inside our epsilon, two epsilon region. No chance. And that's why this function is not continuous. Okay, yeah. Now we have some nice property about uh, inverse functions. If my function is continuous and strictly increasing, then the inverse function is continuous too and also strictly increasing. Look at this uh, example. We have, oh, I mean actually, this does not really look continuous. This is due, due to some uh, graphics problem. So this should actually be a, a continuous function. Huh? And strictly monotonic, then the inverse function, as I hope you know, is what you get uh, as a mirror image on this diagonal. Then this function also is uh, continuous and strictly monotonically increasing. Yeah. Okay, another nice theorem from analysis, which we use very often, we will need it in the future too, is the intermediate value theorem. Um, and this tells us, let's look at the picture. If I have such a closed interval AB and a <coughs> continuous function defined on this closed interval, with the additional property that f of a is negative and f of b is positive, then this function, it might look like this. And our theorem says then this function has at least one root in this interval. So at least one point x where f of x is equal to zero. Or uh, here it's called p. One point p in the interval with f of p equals zero. At least one point. You see in this example we have uh, three such points. And it's really essential that our function is continuous 
what you can see here. This function uh, has all properties. So f of i is negative, f of b is positive. It's defined on this closed interval, but it's not continuous. And you see it has no root in this interval. Okay. Yeah, I mean we can we can apply this immediately to such an example to the function x squared minus two. Yeah? We know this function is continuous because this is continuous and this and the sum is continuous, um, and we uh, we immediately see that f of one is minus one and f of two is two. Um, so we can immediately uh, apply the intermediate value theorem and know that this function has a root between 1 and 2. But there is no p, what is that? Why, why does it say no p? <coughs> this is not correct, sorry. So you have to correct it. Um, There is, of course, a, a, a root between 1 and 2. Yeah. <coughs> so um, we remove this but, and there is, and we remove the no. And which P is it actually? Yeah, square root of 2. Okay. Yeah, and there is a, um, a slight generalization of this theorem which we have here. This says if f of a, so if we have a continuous function on a closed interval, and here we have f of a, and here we have f of b, then this, ta this function takes in, the, in this interval all values between f of a and f of b. Look, is, if f is continuous and y bar is any number between f of a and f of b, this is y bar, then there is at least one point x bar with f of x bar equal to y bar. Okay. Discontinuity. Um, yeah, we have some new, some new notions. Sometimes you read something like the limit for x <coughs> coming or approaching a from above. Huh? This means from above, uh, and this means uh, approach a from below. Um, yeah, and you see approaching from above means, of course, xn is bigger than a, or from below xn is smaller than a. Um, yeah. And we call this the right side or the left side limit um, of f at the point a. Okay.
Okay, and here we have a theorem which holds for one-dimensional analysis only. Yeah? That's important. So only if we are in the real numbers, not in multi-dimensional spaces. For real numbers it holds that a function is continuous at some point A if the right side and the left side limit are the same. Okay, and a function is discontinuous if the limit does not exist. Okay, we just omit this. Um, yeah, and let's look at some examples. Um, yeah. So we have this uh, kind of sawtooth function. And this, of course, is uh, discontinuous at all these points. I mean, we, ca we can just easily apply this theorem. The left and right side um, limits are not equal, and therefore it's not continuous. No? Whenever a function has a pole, then, of course, it's not continuous because from the from the left uh, i mean yeah yeah um, we have two cases the one case is where we have such a pole this is for example 1 over x squared has a pole at x equals 0 and it is not continuous at this point. Huh? Even so, you might say, oh, but the left side limit is infinity and the right side limit is infinity. But infinity is not allowed as a limit. And even more, the function value f of zero is not defined. So how can you de how can you talk about uh, continuity in a point where my function is not defined? So it, it it doesn't make sense. Okay, but what you can do next is you can say, okay, let's take x equals one. We extend our function. We extend our function such that we define it f of 0 is equal to 1. But it still discontinues. It's, it is now defined for x equals 0, but it is still discontinuous. Why? Nothing is negative here. This function is positive everywhere. No, because, because no limit approaches the function value. A function is continuous if all limits approach the function value at this point. But here, no limit approaches one. Huh? Okay, oh yeah, and we look at this third example next time because it's quite funny. Okay, so now, 